y'all for coming tonight. Tonight is the second uh, town hall. Um, just going to give you a quick overview of what we're going to do. Um, a couple of months ago, the school district formed a committee to study our facilities and the needs of those uh, going forward. Tonight is designed for the committee to make a presentation to the public um, to get your feedback. We're going to have an opportunity for questions. Um, we might encourage you to ask questions and find out um, anything you'd like to know about the proposal. We've got four members from the committee that will be proposing tonight. Ann Bates, Marty Jordan, Jeff Murray, and Matt Potter. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Bates right now. So glad to see so many people here tonight. We started this journey by meeting at the high school with people selected to be especially invited by school board members. And of course, with a brother-in-law and a nephew on the school board, I was invited. We were presented with an overview of the schools and their present conditions. We visited the junior high, elementary, and intermediate schools. Although they all have needs, we, as a group, soon agreed that our priority would be securing a new high school and an expanded career and technology facility. As we move forward, we benefited from input from campus principals, teachers, Mr. Albritton, and other staff. We discussed the strengths, expectations, and challenges we face in today's educational field. After settling on a new high school as our main goal, we looked at a past rendering of plans for a high school, input from four teachers, and others were helpful at this time to see the true needs as to space. We discussed the feasibility of renovation, but we agreed a completely new building in a location near the present high school would have the advantage of using the existing gym and music building, as well as the baseball, softball complex, and the football and track facilities. The need for a new K, our career and technology education building, was also seen as being very important in today's changing career needs as well as for safety and control. The next business of the committee was to put together a community survey and the results were quite promising. Our final goal was to recommend long range plan to the board and now Thank you, Ms. Bates. We, as a committee, <coughs> came up with five. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we, as a committee, came up with five recommendations for the uh, to propose to the board. The first one is concerning the new high school, and the committee voted unanimously, unanimously to recommend the construction of a new high school. <coughs> the committee agreed that the new high school should include an expanded career and technology education building, as well as a larger core facility. Our second recommendation was, the committee recommends that the board consider including wording in the bond referendum that specifically states that no monies will be used to renovate or build sports facilities other than the gymnasiums included in the high school. Recommendation number three was, the committee recommends that the board consider the following projects within a six-year time frame, which would include renovation and repurposing of the current Cape building for, administration, for administrative purposes, demolition and replacement of the old Bruce building, upgrade science labs at the Bruce Junior High, and uh, do improvements on the drive and draining, drainage at the Bruce Junior High, and then rerouting the elementary bus traffic. The fourth recommendation we came up with was this was we these were projects within a 10, uh, 12 year time frame. We're going to pave the existing parking at the elementary and uh, repurposing available facilities for early child development and replaceable replacement of portable buildings at the intermediate. The fifth recommendation was. The committee recommends that the board consider adding the following projects to a long-range plan for completion at the board's discretion. 
air conditioning, roof maintenance for all schools, which is going to happen every year, which is going to happen. Uh, upgrade uh, upgrade a bus loop to concrete at the Bruce Junior High. And demolition and sale of other use or other use of the old elementary, old elementary building located on Scott Street. Sale of any unused property and researching and relocation of the transport transportation facilities. The back to recommendation one. Talking about the new high school. The uh, proposed high school additions for the new, uh, new space requirements proposed high school preliminary program for 800 students. The uh, area administration will be 4,580 4, feet, which will include reception, sorry, square feet. Square feet which will include reception, secretaries, principal, assistant principal, counselors, conferences, record storage, or vault, storage, mailroom, workroom, and the nurse. There'll be five teachers' work centers, one per department, and there'll be 1,500 square feet. Uh, central learning facility will be 4,600 square feet. The academic, which will be the classrooms, There'll be 27 classrooms around about 840 square feet and with a computer lab with storage and ROTC and a journalism room with storage at 29,600 square feet total. The special education will be 2,000 feet and that includes central resource lab, a classroom, self-contained with support spaces. The science center will be 12,400 feet, which will be science classrooms, labs. There'll be eight of those at 1,400 square feet apiece. And the science prep with storage. And then the uh, arts will be the red two art studios. Two art studios, which have a storage and a kiln room and storage at 2,300 square feet. And then, the, and then in the Cape, the separate buildings, we'll have the industrial lab, the horticulture lab, four classrooms at 840 square feet, a welding shop, tool storage, health <coughs> science clinic, culinary art lab with classroom storage, for, with a total of 17,010 square feet. Our, cla our, our cafeteria will be 9,200 square feet be dining, waiting, serving lines, food preparation, commodity storage, general storage, walk-in cooler, snack bar with storage, kitchen office, dishwashing with storage, and the loading dock. And then we have our speech and drama room, which would be 6,900 square feet, which would be a 500 seat theater, a prop, prop costume storage, Stage would be 1,200 foot, 1200 square foot stage. Our dressing room and our control production room, and then our gymnasium, which will have two practice gyms. But you have to have those for PE. It's state law. You have to have PE. Uh, there'd be two practice gymnasiums. There'd be full length, 94 foot courts with 200 seats. Uh, used for storage, dance, cheer, dance and cheer dressing, PE dressing facilities for boys and girls and laundry at 19,500 square feet. And then our central facilities, which will be our suspension center, boys and girls toilets, janitorial storage, mechanical, electrical, server room, wiring, main lobby, security office, stairs, elevator, will be 8,500 square feet with a subtotal of 118,700 square feet, and you add in the 33,088 feet, square feet for walls and corridors, and that comes to a total of 151,258 square feet, including the Cape building. The main building would be 129,485 feet, square feet,
and the Cape building will be 21,773 square feet. <coughs> we, uh, we, uh, we as a board, uh, we're talking about that into, uh, there's, this building here has served its purpose, it served its purpose. The floor, the roofs leak, there's not enough bathrooms in this building for all the students that we have. Uh, it would cost $12 million alone to bring this building up to code, adding fire extinguisher, uh, a fire suppression sprinklers in it. Uh, it's got leaking roofs. We, uh, you have, like I said, you don't have, we don't have enough bathrooms in this facility for the amount of students that we have. To get, to even do the twelve, to do the twelve million overhaul of this building, and to get, you would have to have two more bathrooms spaces. Well, you would lose two classrooms doing that, and still you're out twelve million dollars, around twelve million dollars to do that, and you're that's band aid. You're band aid. Uh, I'll turn it over to. Thanks, Mark. Hi everyone. Thank y'all for bringing the cold thing out. Uh, <coughs> about uh, this exciting opportunity. Um, I know for many of you, like me, the biggest concern is the cost of this project, what it's going to cost. Uh, I'm going to go over the numbers with you real quick. Uh, so the cost of the school to build would be around 35 million, a little over 35 million. Um, up here I've got a couple of different financing options, uh, a 25 year loan, I mean a 25 year bond and a 30, 30 year bond. Uh, the 25 year bond is at 3%. Uh, the new payment right there where you see the 2 million, 9,975, that's the total cost principal and interest per year on that bond. Uh, the, that would come out to 26 cents increase in taxes. So a 26 cent increase, uh, that is for a 25 year versus a 30 year. 30 year at three and a quarter uh, is going to be a payment of $1,843,000 a year. Uh, that's a 24 cent increase. So a two cents, two cent difference over five years. Uh, as you can see the difference in total cost, now that 80 million and that 91 million, that's including, that's the total cost including the previous bond had been passed. So the difference, uh, the cost of just the 25 year bond would be about around 50 million. The 30 year bond, the total cost would be around 55 million. So there's $5 million in savings for that additional two cents uh, in increase in taxes. And as a financial advisor, I would, I would suggest going with the, the 25 year, but that's just one of the two options. I'm also gonna run through some some examples here. Uh, so these examples are with exemptions and without exemptions, so the homestead exemptions. Uh, so the first one, you've got a $100,000 piece of property, your homestead, uh, with a $25,000 exemption. So the taxable value is 75000 which comes out to 183. This is all based off the 30-year bond. Uh, taxable uh, annual tax increase of 100, uh, $183. Uh, that comes out to 15 bucks a month or 50 cents a day. Uh, $150,000, same thing, $25,000 exemption, annual cost of $305, $25 a month or 84 cents a day. And then uh, one example without an exemption on a $100,000 piece of property, uh, looking at about $244 a year, $20 a month or 67 cents a day. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt to discuss questions. He's going to go over a few questions that are kind of top questions and then also open it up for your questions. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. How are y'all this evening? Good. Um, I'm just going to go over uh, real quickly uh, just some of the top ten questions that we had on some of the survey uh, that we did on our website, on the Gilmore ISD website. Um, so the first one was, why a new high school? Um, the current facility does not provide um, for high levels of technology to prepare students for college or work. Um, expansion of the CAPE programs and science labs um, that meet STEM specifications are necessary to make our children competitive after they leave here. 
larger core will provide room for expansion and an auditorium for our expanding theater program and musical performances. This, this facility will provide for programmatic educational needs including vocational certifications uh, for the next 65 years based on the current facility <coughs> life. Uh, number two was how many square feet and for how many students. Uh, of course, uh, Ann and Marty kind of touched on this. The uh, uh, square footage, you're looking at 151,000 square foot. That is including the Cape facility. And um, the, core, the core that we were talking about uh, was geared toward 800 students um, with room for possible expansion, um, if need be, if, if numbers fluctuate. Um, how much will it cost? Um, estimating at um, 35, just over $35 million. Uh, how will this affect my school taxes? Um, approximately 24 cents per $100 evaluation without any exemptions. Number five, what do, you, um, what do the over 65 tax freeze mean? Um, the dollar amount of school taxes are frozen at age 65, uh, creating a tax ceiling um, on your homestead. Uh, number six, what is our current academic standing? Um, if you look in this brochure right here, it kind of goes over where a lot of the uh, um, uh, current academic standings are as far as the school goes. Um, it kind of give you a little bit more details into that. Um, number seven, um, what is our current financial standing? Um, according to FIRST, um, we have a superior with A-plus bond rating. Number eight, who selected the facility committee? Um, a board member nominated and invited over, uh, excuse me, board members <coughs> nominated and invited over 60 community members. All meetings were open and an open invitation to the community was extended. Members of the committee were encouraged to invite others as well. Number nine, how can the community provide input? Of course, first and foremost is coming to these town hall meetings. Um, the other is um, on our on the Gilmer ISD website. We do have the uh, the survey um, that Miss Ann had brought up there or showed on the screen. Um, you can go on there and, and <coughs> excuse me and fill that out. Um, that'll give us a little bit more feedback and a little bit more input and in what you know what you're looking at or kind of what your feelings are toward everything. You can ask questions on there. It's very interactive. Um, Number 10, when would a bond election occur? Um, that would occur in May of 2018 this year. Um, we have uh, passed out some of the, the cards, um, index cards. Um, if you have any questions or anything that you've written down on those index cards, if you want to pass them into the middle, Miss Ann is going to help, help take those up. And I, I, I want to address a, a few things before we open, open it up. Okay. Um, we're barely three hours into this process. And um, there's already a, a few things that are being passed around on social media that need to be addressed. Um, there was a comment made today that Gilmer already has one of the highest uh, tax rates in East Texas. Um, Blade Waters is currently at $1.56. Um, Gilmer's is $1.22 right now. Kilgore's is $1.30. Longview's $1.51. Pine Tree $1.55. As far as I know, I looked at a map this morning, they're in East Texas. So um, we're not one of the highest in East Texas by any means. Secondly, um, there's a, a figure floating around on the internet today, $110 million. Okay? It was based on the total cost of the payments. Um, if you look, the total cost here is estimated at 80 and 91, which is quite a far ways from 110. So I don't know where those numbers are coming from either. And actually, this number represents the bond from uh, 2004, as does this one. And um, we were uh, very uh, simple in providing these numbers. Basically, when we took these payments, we just multiplied. 1.2 times 25 and 1.2 times 30. These, this loan is not a 30-year loan. It's, this one's only 20 at 25, and what was the number? It will be paid off in 19 years. So, so it's years. not a 30. This number doesn't represent a 30 or a 25-year loan. So this number ends up being 74 million total and 79, again, which is nowhere near that one. 
Um, last comment. And then, yeah, that, that includes the interest rate. The last comment was that um, there was no way that a 24 cent increase in taxes would be able to pay a $35 million loan. One penny in our school district generates approximately $80,000 of revenue. So, if you take 24 pennies times $80,000, that's $1.9 million. And that covers, at the 30 year note, I did, that covers that payment. Right in And that's how we got that, that uh, where was the, the 24 cent? Yeah, from out there. And so I just, before, uh, I do want to open it up to questions, but before, in case those questions popped up, I wanted to address those before they got too, too much traction. One thing that we did talk about uh, on Tuesday that it's not hadn't been brought up so far is right now the uh, square footage of classrooms is approximately 750 square feet, and one of the things that teachers and many staff thought was important was to increase the size of the classrooms. Right now, you know. As a population, we're all getting bigger and taller and crowding students into smaller and smaller spaces, and that's the problem, one of the big problems here in this building. The, the, the largest classroom we have is, is about 750 square feet. The average size is about 600 square feet. <laughs> All right, so first one, uh, first question asked was um, only a practice gym or, and are there any plans for the old gym here? Um, what we had talked about was the, the competition gym that is now, the, the new gym, uh, new-ish gym, uh, <laughs> will, will stay in place. That one will be there. The old gym that, will be, uh, that is attached to this facility will be torn down when this facility is torn down. Uh, that is why we were um, saying there will be, when the, the facility was brought forth and we talked about the planning for that, you have to have a certain amount of space for those uh, PE programs. And so we talked about there will be two gyms, two practice gyms or PE gyms that were built inside the new uh, facility. Um, and so th that will cover those needs, allow for practice gyms and PE, and you will still have that competition gym as, as the main gym. Um, and that was what was talked about amongst our committee members. Um, uh, did, does that answer that question? For is, is the athletic just a drill team and all that going to share it with? Mm -hmm. there, yeah, it's going to be open use for um, like the, the, the drill team, um, cheer. Um, there's going to be a lot of different uses as far as out of those two gyms that will be in the, the, the central. Mm -hmm kind of the central of the facility, so. They're full-size gyms. Yeah, they're full-size gyms. <laughs> Mr. Bowman's here, he can kind of address the way the gym scheduling works now. What kind of classes do we use? Well, who uses the gym right now? Currently, we have, we have to limit the number of PE classes we have, because you got to think, during the athletic period, for example, now, 10 years ago, this wasn't the case, <clears throat> we have three girls' basketball teams, this is basketball season, three girls' basketball teams, three boys basketball teams trying to share two gyms. You've got six teams sharing two gyms. That doesn't include ROTC, doesn't include cheerleading, doesn't include PE classes, doesn't include drill team and dance. All sharing two gyms. So that's where, who will be able to use the extra facilities. So now, her husband's a coach. He gets his freshman basketball team up here at 5.30 in the morning. And JV. Yeah. And, and JV. Yeah. So they, they practice at 5.30 in the morning <laughs> just to be able to have you know, an hour and a half practice. Um, so we're sharing it that way right now. Does that help, Matt? Yes. Thank you. The competition gym would be the game gym as well as practice stuff. The old gym here would be the two So we'd have three We'd have three. We use it during the daytime? We are. We'd have three instead of two. Remember, we got six teams practicing. We'd have three gyms instead of two. 
Question. Um, there was a question that said the, the comptroller shows that we uh, are currently it's $9,380 debt per student for Gilmer ISD. Uh, this bond would increase the debt load to 23800 uh, per student. Um, is this justified? I'm not. <laughs> That's a community question. Yeah. I mean, is it? How do you feel? Do you like? Do you like? Do you want to continue band-aiding this place? May, may I expand on the question? Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So here's the challenge I have. I'm trying to figure out. Will's Point is a similar size school district to Gilman ISD. Same 2,400 students, about the same number of teachers, same number of students. They have roughly the same budget. They have the same number of buildings, roughly, in terms of campuses. They have the same tax rate. Our debt load under this plan would be twenty-four thousand per student. Will's Will Point's debt load, eight hundred dollars per student. My point is, it is possible to have a great educational system. By the way, their average AT, ACT scores are higher than ours, and their SAT scores are higher than ours. So my point is, it's possible to have a great education system without taking on tremendous debt. So that's the basis of my question: Is it really justified? They have brand new houses. Their debt load is 800 per They have brand new houses. Bottom line, mm -hmm. bottom line yeah, it's their debt load. And it, it's been here recently, probably within the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. What are their demographics there? Very similar. It's all available online. Tribune has no apples to oranges because of when they built their buildings and passed their bonds. At the end of the day, they have debt, we have debt. Right. Their debt is significantly lower. We're not talking about the difference between eight thousand and ten thousand. We're talking about the difference between we're talking about the difference between eight hundred dollars per student and what will be twenty four thousand dollars per student. That's not insignificant. That's a question yeah. worth asking. Can I uh, just address a little bit? Okay. The, uh, the way schools are funded in the state of Texas depends on the property value of Okay, to speak up, I can do that. I got a teacher voice. <laughs> the way schools are funded in the state of Texas is based on property values. So they're very locally, I mean, that we have school districts in this area that because their property values are so high, their debt is extremely low because their taxes, our taxes raise $80,000, one penny. And Will's point, I'm not sure what the number is. I would have to look it so up. I have their budget if you'd like to see it. I need to see what their appraised values are. Because there again, in Tatum, Tatum one penny of tax raises 600000 They have a smaller school. So, so in other words, to pay off debt, they can pay it off much faster with one penny. It takes us a longer period of time. Go to New Diana or City, one penny of tax raises six or $7,000. And so it's really not a comparison of apples to orange on that debt per person because it's based on a local amount. Now, it, it, that's a local question. And that's why INS is determined this way. Sure. And it's, you have to determine that it's your, you know what your values are, you know what you can raise. But to say that they're doing a better job or they have more money or their, their debt load is lower because of the school system, even though the number of students, that's not a proper comparison. You really got to look and see how wealthy, and, and when I use the word wealthy and poor, I'm talking about the property values in the district, the ability to tax. The main problem with, with, with uh, funding in the state of Texas is just that, that you can live in one county or in one school district and right next door just because you're sitting on oil or coal, you can afford to build at a much uh, faster rate because you can raise taxes higher. And so that's, that's an issue that the state of Texas has to do a better job of because poor districts, and when I say poor districts, districts of low property value, it's very difficult for them to build buildings. And when you look across the state of Texas, it's easy to see that. Uh, in East Texas, there are many school districts that have just waited as long as they can. They finally bitten the bullet and decided that it was more important to have a school. It's a community decision. That's why you have meetings like this. That's why you discuss it. That's why you vote on it. Because it's a local decision for what you want to provide. And so I, I get the comparison. And, and uh, I, I don't want to 
and say I appreciate it because I don't like the way schools are funded. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair for one school district to be able to build a school because they can raise $600,000 and we can't. I think our kids deserve the same, no matter what. And in the state of Texas, we have to fix that. So, At the end of the day, my point is simple. I, I that does matter. I, 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 it, and you can look back five or seven years on the Texas Comptroller's website, and their debt has always been So they can pay it off quicker, no doubt. But their debt because their property, their, property values, their property values are so much higher. The median. Uh, the that's median just an explanation. I'm trying not to argue there. The Gilmer is $85,000. The median home value in Wills Point is $165,000. Yeah. So that's yeah. a part of it. Sure. But I don't know the But rate. there is still a reasonable question of debt. Absolutely. Is 25000 per student a reasonable thing to take on? Yeah, if you ask me, it is. For some, it may not be. But to me, it is a reasonable amount of debt to take on. So that's my answer. But what do you think 12 years of private school would cost? <clears throat> it cost a lot. What's, what's, what's the point? point? Is it more than 24000 Sure. That is, okay. Absolutely. What's the point? You were asking is $24,000 for, for a student? I'm talking about debt. I'm talking about that, taking But effectively, that's what we're debt. looking at. We're going to pay that money to educate our kids. To me, it's, it's and that's what we're going to vote. You, you're welcome yeah. to vote no. You asked me a question. That's I asked North Public debt going from 9000 a year. And that's part of my concern with this meeting is you could show us that. You could show that public debt right now is 9000 per student per year. I don't and think it's going to go work in 24,000. Right, we're, we're getting into preferences now, and you're, you cast your vote the way you want to, and we're thankful for your question. But now's not the time to lobby. No, it's not. I'm just saying you could show us that with clarity. But you I'm, just did show us. So that's right. what me showing you is not going to gain anything. Well, except that's your job, isn't it, to show us the clear details. On the next slide, you showed us the increase per our property. But yet, I believe you said that was that increase projected was based on the 30-year plan. Correct. Did I hear you right? That's correct. But you also recommended the 25-year plan. So really, if you go to the next slide where you yeah, show so the you, property tax increases, they'll actually be higher than you show. I, I think if, if you do the 25-year plan, which you recommend. Correct. I would recommend that. I think you should be two dollars the purpose per of this meeting. The purpose of this meeting is not to. Uh, promote or not to promote a bond issue. The committee has come together and worked the last three months. They've looked through all the facilities. They've made a, def a decision on what they feel like they're going to go to the board with and ask the board to consider. The board hadn't voted on this. Nothing's happened at all. And so they're trying to get input from y'all with regard to what to consider. So at this point in time, I don't think it is the obligation to show all the debt. When, if, if the board votes to have a bond issue, then uh, all that information will be out there in multiple venues. <coughs> and so this this meeting is to gather input, and we appreciate the input. That's something we can add down the road when a bond issue, if it's even called. We don't even know that it's going to be called. So the purpose of this meeting is really to gather input. And to get good input, sure. to rely on good detail. Right. But not so the, the next slide you show is where you show 300 increase per year. The 25 a year plan is much more than $305 of increase a year. You show the most favorable. 317 or 330 dollars a year. Right. See, so showing us it's all the extra twenty four dollars per hundred thousand. <laughs> and the uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've got a question about this figure about twenty five thousand dollars per student. It's thirty five million dollars, and I'm sitting here looking at if you divide that by an enrollment of twenty four forty nine, that comes out to I guess the fourteen thousand you add to the nine thousand. Is that correct? But over thirty years, you're going to have more than twenty four. 149 students enroll in the school, so your figure's incorrect. The, the Texas Comptroller takes current debt divided by current enrollment. So current enrollment. I understand that, but over 30 years of, or however many years, there's going to be more than that enrolled, so your figure per student isn't correct. All, all yeah. we can do is go on the current enrollment. Yeah. That's what the well, I understand that. that. And, and there again, and more statistically, than, numbers can say a lot of different things. So I think I think we've all made our point. Can Texas we move on? Yeah. Sure. Let's, let's move on to the next.
Um, what, what is the projected student population in five to ten years? Um, I'll go ahead and answer that one first. Um, we talked about it over the last 20 to, what was it, 20 to 25 years, there's been a fluctuation of, a, it's really stayed very similar. You've had little bumps and little uh, downfalls as far as the, the, the numbers, but they've kind of stayed the same as far as the amount of students that we've had over that time frame. Uh, of course, you're always going to have some kind of fluctuation in there, but um, there's not been a, a drastic increase. I think we said that there was like um, a, a fluctuation of like 20 to 40 students over that time frame down and, and, and up. In the, in the 2000s, mm -hmm. it's, it's fluctuated roughly between <coughs> 630 and 7, maybe 730. So it's fluctuated with 100. Um, in the 90s to 80s, it fluctuated between 650 all the way down to 580. And then in the 70s, it was trending lower. Uh, usually consistently below the 600 mark. Gotcha. And we, we might add, this high school was designed for 600 students. So, and it looked like 100, 700, 700, 700, 700 right now. Okay. So when this building was initially designed, it was designed for 600, and, and we're, at, we're at 700 at the moment. Um, we talked about, of course, you're always going to have the possibility of different things coming in as far as... Uh, job facilities, especially you think about it, if, if, let's just say for instance there's a new high school bill. You have the possibility of more people coming in due to the fact that you have a nice new facility. Um, yes, there's a possibility for a, a raise or an increase in, in the amount of students that go. Um, the other thing is, is that um, we were actually talking about this the other night at the, on, on Tuesday night was, um, I don't know if, if y'all have heard, but Dollar General, they actually just uh, decided to build a warehouse down in, in the, the, the industrial park in Longview that is actually on this side of, of Longview. And so that's right down the road from our actual district lines. Those district lines, our district lines run all the way down uh, close to 1844 there. Okay. So it, you know, you have that possibility of taking on some of those, those, because I think they said there were going to be around 400 jobs with that that warehouse being built. Yeah, yes, you have the potential for, you know, an increase in, in students. That's why we we looked at a core facility. The the core is what we say, like your your uh, your you know cafeteria, your your gyms, your uh, your uh, office space, your all that stuff is designed for you know the larger amount of students. And you can always expand classroom wise. You can actually take it if it's if you know design the way they design it. You can take and add on classrooms, uh, you know, onto those ends if you need space as far as classroom wise. But as far as the core goes, if you design it for a little bit larger contingency as far as student wise, you, you know, you're looking for that increase in that expansion. Um, current square foot of the existing facilities in total I think Mr. Albritton what is that current what's the current, current 90,000 90,000 square foot thank you so you're looking at an increase of uh, you know nearly 60,000 square foot between and that that includes the Cape facility so you know I think we said it was 120 what was that 120 yeah. for the actual minus the Cape building it was 129 for 40 but 129 for yeah so just under 130,000 square foot is what you're looking at as far as difference between now and, and then. Um, why the long time frame for <coughs> excuse me, recommendation four? Bring up what was sure. I'm looking at the right one. Let's see, and then 12 year time frame. <coughs> That was something that, as far as the some of those that were brought up, um, of course, the, the paving of the parking at the elementary, replacement of affordable buildings, and repurposing of facilities that we have for early childhood. Um, as far as the early childhood part goes, um, of course, when we first built the, the new elementary, it was designed for around, what was that, was it 1,200 students. And so we had initially kind of, that was the reason we brought this up was, you know, if we still, you know, what is the current amount of students? A thousand students we have in there right now. So we brought that up as just, in case we do have that fluctuation, you talk about having, you know, people come in as far as, 
you know, high school and, and different people moving into the district as far as with the, the, the fluctuation. We talked about possibilities for early childhood development. If you move those, you know, pre-K facilities and have those early childhood years, that opens expansion and opens classrooms and hallways for other students. That allows you kind of some, some, uh, some growing room if you need that. And that's, that's a potential possibility. That was just something that we had, as, a, as a group kind of brainstormed and, and thought about. Um, also discussed briefly expanding that from age four to age three. Mm -hmm. So in the future, having even younger kids able to go into early childhood mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. Get them, at, get them in, into the, uh, or get them around and, and learning at a younger age. Um, let's see, as far as the uh, paving existing parking and the portable building, of course, portable building is something that, that's been there for mi many moons is what I'm going to say. Uh, it's been there for a long time. I, I was in school there when that portable building was there. But when you, you have that, you know, removal of that and possibly, <coughs> excuse me, um, adding on some more classes there at the, the like the intermediate that allows for that expansion as well if you do have a fluctuation of, of, of students you know uh, come in um, and of course you know paving and parking um, that just wasn't something that we saw as you know it, it is in the forecast of things to come it just wasn't um, as at the forefront as, as far as what the committee brought up as, as far as ideas so um, it is in the long range plan as far as you know presenting that to the board but just was uh, uh, like I said, we had other things that, that we knew we needed to, to get rolling and get taken care of at first. Uh, the next question is, what will happen to the existing existing Kate building? Um, what the committee had talked about was um, with the current facility, and the reason we had brought up the expansion of the Kate facility, besides needing more area for those STEM requirements, um, was. Right now, that facility, um, we brought this up the other night, right when that facility was built in, what was it, 2005? 2005. When that facility was built in 2005, it was designed to be able to handle around 300 students in and out, you know, throughout that, that, that school day. And so, right now, I think we on average have around 500 students that actually use that. And if y'all don't know, we have one of the biggest ag programs in the state of Texas. And that's 6A, 5A, all the way through. We have one of the largest ag programs um, in the state. And so you have a lot of people that are coming in and out of that building and really outgrown that facility, um, which is fantastic because that shows you there's a lot of kids that are motivated and want to be involved in those, those type of um, um, courses and want to be, you know, try to go get certified and everything in those STEM courses. Um, so we, we talked about... Um, Afterwards, so best to answer the question, after we talked about the other thing that we needed to look at as a district and as a committee was, what are we going to do as far as an administration building? This was something that was brought up. Because not only is this facility very old, that facility is older. And in a lot, it, 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 this facility is in very bad shape, but that facility is in, in, in worse shape. Right? Yes, exactly. And so the, the, the thought was, well, why don't we look at repurposing that facility into an administration building? It's there, it's here, it's close. Take and repurpose that facility that we have already. You can expand the Cape facility and then still use that facility as well. That was what we brought up as, as a committee. Um, so that's something to think about as well. Um, what is the current high school square footage? We, we hit on that one. Uh, it's 90, around 90,000 square foot. Um, thank you. Can the bond money allocations be changed once approved? Can you change your mind on what you want to spend the money on once you get it? No. That's kind of against the law. So once it's, uh, once it's appropriated and once it's, that's what that is passed for, you cannot change those funds. That's, that is law. That one's kind of aimed at me, yeah. so I'll just go. There's a brochure, there's a brochure out there. There, there have been. This is what it looks like. Rumors that talk about repurposing the bond money from the previous bond issue. Again, that's against the law. It wasn't done, and an exact accounting of those monies are in that brochure. And you can see that we use fund balance in that first uh, that first time frame to the tune of almost four million dollars to do some additional things. Uh, and the amount of monies on each facility were spent or overspent rather than underspent. So 
that is in there, and it also shows all the capital projects that have occurred since, from about 2003 to about 2015. So it's just an idea of all the capital improvements that have occurred since I've been here. Uh, but there's an accounting for all that. Those, that's come from the audits that are done in the years. Yes, and uh, that, that is true. You, when you when you look at when the if the board decides that they want to <coughs> recommend a, a bond package, then the wording in the uh, proposition is very specific. It was specific in those, and you have to use the monies according to uh, the way it's described in that bond proposition. Next question was, um, if I heard correctly, will we need uh, approximately $12 million to repair the HVAC roofing uh, even if we don't build a new school? Yes, to get everything up to code as far as this facility goes, uh, replacing AC, you know, your HVAC system, your, your fire system, uh, sprinklers, uh, getting the bathrooms up to code, all that as far as getting that up to where it needs to be, you're looking at about $12 million renovation. On Not this only facility, that, you're losing two classrooms. To yeah, you're losing two classrooms. But <laughs> yes, that is, that would be twelve million dollars. So you're looking at a third of that cost of what we talked about as far as that thirty-five million dollars. A third of that cost to renovate, you know, this school just to put a band-aid on it, basically. And so, you know, if you look at that, to me, if you look at that, it's it's kind of a that's that's kind of overwhelming. So. Um, could a board member tell us what the property tax increase would have, would have, uh, oh, I'm sorry, would have been had the state of Texas not changed their mind at the last uh, let's see, session? Yeah, it was, sorry, I was trying to read. Um, to fund the school districts the same as the prior year. Sorry, let me read that again. Could a board member tell us what the property tax increase would have been um, if the state of che Texas would not have changed their mind um, as far as how to fund school districts uh, the same as the prior year? I, don't know if that... I, I, I will say I'm honored that somebody thinks that I could answer that question off the top of my head. <laughs> but I cannot. Did somebody think that the taxes were raised last year? I'll, I'll, uh, I'm the one that wrote that down. Okay. And I know for a fact, because my co-partner at work is on a school board, and he was facing, they were facing with a dilemma because the state was prepared to not fund the school districts in the state of Texas the same as, as the prior year. And they only made an exception for this year, not meaning next year will be the same. And it would have been a, a pretty substantial increase for this uh, individual school district that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. with the, with the our M &O, board board, so. We can't, we cannot raise our M and O tax rate without going to the voters. So the board can't raise the M and O tax rate without going to the board. Well, right, but I understand that. But y'all would have had to have the same. Uh, we would have had to have a reduction in force. Y'all would have had to have the same foresight as he did, knowing they might have had to raise it. And I guess people need to be aware of that, that the state of Texas is right now in a state of flux on, on school funding, and, and they could very well revisit this next year because it was just a rainy day fund uh, exception or whatever. So you're looking at projected it could be a larger increase than just what y'all are uh, talking about for uh, the well, school bond. If you remember when all that did occur, I think the governor and, and Dan Patrick's statement was the school districts just need to tighten their belts. Uh, it's not to raise taxes. They're, what they're saying is provide fewer services. And so that's really the answer to that. You're going to have to cut your spending. You're going to have to, uh, when this occurred in Gilmer ISD in 2012, you lost, they, they cut $5 billion from funding for the, for the state. Gilmer ISD lost over a million and a half dollars. And that year, uh, we didn't have any layoffs, but we didn't replace 38 people. And so, and, and our services go down, it makes it more difficult to, you know, your pupil-teacher ratio goes up. Uh, we're in district, there's a lot of uh, economically disadvantaged students, and so we, we do, or we try to keep our staff at a higher ratio, but a lot of kids that come to Gilmer ISD, and I, I say this a lot of different ways, and it's on Facebook, and I'm going to talk about my granddaughter for a minute, but my granddaughter has, her mother is a librarian, She's been read to since the day she came to school. I mean, since the day she was born. When she started 
at five years old in kindergarten, she started with probably about 30,000 words, 20 to 30,000 words. When kids come to us from poverty, they generally have between four and 600 words. And so we have higher teacher-pupil ratios, I mean smaller ratios, but a higher number of staff to try to help accommodate that and help kids overcome the lack of uh, some of the schooling that, that would necessarily be given at home. Because a lot of those people, it's not that they aren't good, they're working. They're working two jobs, three jobs, and so they're just not there. And so what we have to do is try to catch those up. And that's one of the reasons you see our reading scores, we're doing a, a lot of work to try to catch those kids up but what it comes down to, the, 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 the legislator was very clear in that. We're, we're, we're going to cut your funding, and what that means is you're not going to raise taxes. You're going to cut what you do. Yes, sir. And, and the thing you just said about the words for child, that would be a very good thing to differentiate us from Will's point. I, I would agree. That's not really, that deal with debt, but it definitely deals with expense. Correct. Yes, sir. How far has, has, has the uh, funding from the state fallen from a high to where it's at now percentage oh, wise? Well, well, I did this example the other day. <laughs> Let, let's suppose, and there again, let's go back to local taxation and, and the state taking its share. Back in 2012, they adjusted things. And really, the state started paying about 50% of the cost of education, and the local school district pays about 50% of the, the cost of children. That was back then. But what happens is that same year they set something called target revenue. We can't really raise our revenue because if we get if our property appraisals go up, everybody's does. That's been I mean that's a huge issue because what uh, we kind of get the blame. Your taxes go up because your property values go up. Well, what happens is for school districts, okay, for school districts, we have a target per child, $5,200 about is what it is. And if we collect more taxes, then the state reduces their funding. So when property appraisals increase, the state benefits. So if we had, if, if our bill was $1,000 back in 2012, today, we raise $700 locally, the state sends us $300. So the state just benefited $200. Now that money's not going to Gilmer ISD. That's going to the state, and they're reissuing that in some other program. And that's one of the reasons you see, if you really look at the state numbers, the state's burden for education has stayed at about $25 billion per year. But in that same time frame, we're adding 90,000 students a year. That's a city in the state of Texas to be revisited because you're right the legislature is going to do something and local school districts they're removing our ability we used to be able to to in, in the old days when your property values went up we had something called the effective tax rate remember that I've been doing this since 1984 so we had the effective tax rate and you couldn't raise your overall revenue if you did you had to tell the voters effectively we raised this amount of revenue today we're raising more revenue but well, what's happened is the state's taking it. We're not sending it to up to them. Now, in a wealthy district, Tatum, when I was talking about them, they're sending millions of dollars every year to the state. Carthage. But for us, but it's so much, they're so wealthy, it doesn't matter. It's true. It's true. I wish we had that problem. <laughs> but, but for us, our, our local taxpayers are bearing state burdens because of the way the system's set up. Or Arnold. You've been in it a lot longer than yeah. I have. <laughs> uh, well, that, that one thing you need to understand, this districts like Taylor and Carthage, they can build buildings because they get to keep 100%. If they pass the bond issue, they get to keep 100% of that money toward their facilities. So they build. They, in fact, they use a lot of... Uh, I, I work with districts uh, all over the state. and uh, In fact, I just finished project down on the coast and uh, the district down there just had a, a 12 billion dollar natural gas liquefied natural gas plant coming in that's going to give them a few bucks to work with <laughs> so uh, what they can do then is take that and so now what they're going to do instead of paying for out of M&O they're going to buy all their buses out of that 
they, so they've got to get the taxpayer to vote to approve bonds for the purpose of buying those things. Well, in your case, you really can't do that because you don't have, because M and O, you're li limited there and you're limited the other way. So that, that's where the equities come in. And uh, yes, the state provided some monies back earlier for facilities, but Gilbert doesn't qualify. Most of that went to the valley, and all of it's gone now. There's just not, not hardly anything left. For the state of Texas, they allocated $120 million. <laughs> That's for the state of Texas. <laughs> so it's, it's a little, they're a little bit short. You can tell I'm a little, I can talk about this forever. Yeah. Uh, and y'all don't want me talking about it forever because it's something I do. I have a lot of passion about because it is, I've always worked for school districts that are not wealthy. And I've always worked for school districts that have high poverty in them. And, and I have a, a, a heart for that. We need to stand up. And we need to make our, our equitable funding for students in the state of Texas is a must. Or we're just going to continue to separate uh, and desegregate, not according to race, but according to wealth. And that's a different kind of wealth, not property wealth. What we're trying to do here this evening is give you an opportunity to say to this group, they, they want your input so they can go back and finalize their recommendations that will go to the board. And that was the whole idea of doing the town hall, is for them to get the information, and then we can take everything we're hearing, and we will have another meeting next Thursday. And we're going, at that time, meet with the committee, and the committee then will finalize its recommendation, which it will present to the board at a later time. So we really appreciate you being here. We have one more come in. Um, estimated time for completion for a new high school. Uh, we were talking about the other night. Um, uh, John was kind of giving us a, a rundown. He was not able to be here with us tonight. But um, he said if we were able to get everything going and kind of get on top of things, uh, you, and this is not set in stone, so don't quote me on this, but you'd probably be looking around fall of 2020. It would be if they were able to get the drawings and everything kind of situated it within you know maybe a six-month time frame, you're looking at about the, the fall of 2020. Yeah. To build. Yeah, about 18 months to build. It'll take about six months to do the drawings. In other words, or you get everything complete. And it's probably about an 18 month uh, uh, construction time. The problem you're going to have here uh, is anytime you're trying to build on the same site where you are moving, then you have some movement, and all that will have to be planned out because you'll be using this building while you construct a new building, then you have to come back in and tear everything down. So that will require some timing to make that happen. But it can be done. In, uh, in fact, I'm, almost, I'm really amazed at our public transportation system, the fact how we can build roads the way we build them and keep traffic moving. So it's almost the same thing. We have to keep school going at the same time when you do that and make sure you have safety. And that's, that's it. Yes, if, if it came to where it was remodeled, how long would that take? And where would the students go to school during remodeling? That is a lot of the problem. When, you, when you're trying to do renovations, about the only time you do renovations is scattered over a couple, three years, and you try to come in and do it during the summertime when the students are not here, and then you start trying to work around it. And then, so anytime you're doing a renovation, it makes it, it's very, very difficult to work around and have safety for the kids. There's one, one more little question. 15 year loan consideration rather than a 25 or a 30. Can they do a 15, a 15 instead of year, a 25 uh, or 30? Loan consideration versus. Yeah, I mean, good. Yeah, that's. I mean, the board, we, that, that's something the board's going to do. We did just 25 or 30. So because of our wealth, I think when you get down, you're, you're looking more at, I mean, well, to go from 25 to 30 was about two cents. So you can figure at least another two cents down and then another two cents down on that. So uh, but the payment would go up probably, ooh, I don't know. I, I, we just didn't do those numbers. And if we, I think the board generally feels that if we have this much divisiveness over 24 cents, 
it's only going to be worse over 29 or 32 cents. Mm -hmm. and so, you but know, the I, amount we would save in doing that size of loan would well, be it worth it. It makes, great. I don't know what the it makes financial, is, sen years, financial sense. Financial sense. I'm not going to argue that. Um, but logic doesn't always come into reason doesn't always come into play. <laughs> Um, I do want, we do want to have the opportunity, if you didn't get a chance to write down a question or if you did want to uh, make a comment, we, we do want you to feel free to do that. And so um, we just want to, I just wanted to open up the mic for a few minutes if anybody had a question or a comment. Oh, did you just say you'd like to stand there or come up either way? Stand here is okay. fine. But uh, I just wanted to say, uh, I know we've tried this in the past. And, Everybody's here for a common goal and a common reason. I know there's positive and negative, but um, if you just take a look around you and you drive around the state, you see all these other schools and communities prospering. A lot of that has to do with people rallying and getting behind the cause. And what I'm seeing here in Gilmer, with 20 years behind the curve, I mean, look around us and drive around this great state of Texas and look at this economy. Um, New schools everywhere support our youth, our future leaders of this great state, and the prosperity of our nation. That's important to me, and I think everybody in this room. But this fine community needs this school. This fine community needs all of these people to be able to prosper. And you don't do that just by um, maybe being naysayers and stuff. So um, I think it's time that you know good new schools attract great teachers who want to be here. Good schools uh, with great teachers attract more aspiring families. More good teachers and families contribute to our local businesses. And all this leads to increased property values that more than offset minimal tax increases. And I mean minimal tax increases. And how could you not support the movement to brighten the future of our youth in this community? So I say vote for it. I know that's kind of a platform, but um, it's time. And thank you guys for putting this together. Amen. Anybody else have? Oh. Oh, Sarah. Go. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, because I'm a parent, I see some students in the room, and, and I know how, how I could assume if I sat down and talked to my child about all of this, but I mean, I'm sure the committee and the board and, uh, Teachers and admin have talked to the students, but have have any of the students of the schools from freshmen up to seniors had an opportunity to voice their opinion in front of our community members? I mean, would it be beneficial? I'm sure that they have, but just out of curiosity. I mean, how do our students feel about um, the school that they have been going to school in and for their underclassmen peers? I got that one right there. Yeah, right there, Mason. Go ahead and. Uh, I'm Mason, I'm 18 years old, I'm a senior at Gilmer High School this year, and I've gone to this school for the past four years, and so my classmates are with me right now, and what Gilmer ISD, Gilmer ISD has incredible administration, they have incredible teachers who do their absolute best, and they do a very good job of preparing us for school. But our facilities are lacking. I mean, there's times where there's support columns on the roof, like they said, there, uh, class my sophomore year. I physically could not see my teacher because of a support column in the classroom. And so keep moving on. I've seen whole desks have to be rearranged because it rained yesterday and so the ceilings are leaking in the classrooms. I mean, our labs, our science labs, we cannot offer AP Physics because our labs don't meet AP Physics requirements. And so I'm going to be taking the AP Physics test this, this spring, but I'm having to do it from, like, I'm taking it on my own. And I'm having to like learn the material from a teacher. I'm not getting to use the labs that are required for the course. I'm having to have one of our teachers who is amazing <clears throat> explain and try to get me to grasp the concept just without having to see the visuals of a lab that helps. I've seen teachers have to work around things that they can't control. I mean, of course, people come here and people just, I mean, you go down the halls and there's not a day where you can't hear someone complain about something that happened with the school. I mean, 
it's just incredible. And I believe that we have some of the brightest students in East Texas. Our, our achievement scores show that. Five out of six distinctions, or six out of seven, I forget the official number. And I believe, I, Mr. Bowman told me, that the only one that was missing was attendance. And so I personally believe that you can attribute a lot of that to the unattractiveness and the unwillingness of someone to want to come and be I don't know, dripped on the head by a, by a roof. I mean, I mean that in all seriousness. I mean, I've seen people who may not necessarily care about their future and education, or their they might not have the desire to go to college, or they may just think like, eh, I'm just being forced to go here. I don't really have any care to do it. So they don't really put much stock or value in going to school and getting an education. So, I mean, if they already don't want to be there, if something, if they felt like they didn't, if the facilities aren't up to date, or something or it's cramped in all the classrooms, I mean, their thought process is going to be, why show up? I mean, I mean, personally, I value education a lot, and I've tried, I mean, I'm at school as much as I can, and I speak from telling my classmates as well. I mean, we're going to be at school because we value our education, and so I believe that, that this school does need to be revamped. By, adding, by building a new school and putting more classrooms and larger class sizes, I not only believe that would encourage more students to attend, but I believe that would increase our ability to do more things such as STEM. STEM is blowing up. I mean, the future is STEM, almost. And so our teachers right now are doing everything they can to prepare us. Um, as of right now, myself and this camera with me, we're taking AP Chemistry, AP Calculus, I'm taking a Physics course, I've taken several courses in the past that are all STEM directed. And they're doing everything they can with what they are provided. Oh, STEM is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. That's like your engineering and your medicine, all your science related fields. And so you see all this new advancing things that are going on in STEM. And so I think that with a new school and new facilities, we, we, we kind of catch up with the curve here. Our teachers are doing so amazing to catch us up there. But if we had, the new, if we had new facilities and new new equipment and everything that's that's being speaking of right now that could go to the bond. I mean just imagine where we'd go. We'd have the facilities and the teachers. And so I just speak passionately about that because I've gone to school here for four years. I mean the school is in desperate need of some help. And I do believe that this would be the best idea. You have to pay for all those AP courses on your own, do you? The school covers part of them and I believe I, I believe students like fifty dollars to take the test. Fifty dollars for AP to take, take the test, test because the district covers some of it. Which, <coughs> I mean, that speaks to our the districts and the administration believing in our kids. I mean, AP test doesn't guarantee you anything. I mean, you very likely could go in there and not get any credit, and so basically all you did you learned, but then it's not going to give you any college credit. But our school and administration is putting so much faith and support into our kids that they're willing to hold half the bill for that because they believe in us and they believe in the education that our teachers are giving us. And so I believe it's time to, I think we should repay the administration and the teachers by increasing some, the, by increasing the, I don't know, the, the value of our facilities. And so I believe that with all of this new stuff we hear in all these new schools and you go around East Texas, you'll see some very nice schools but I mean, if you check the Texas Education Assessment, some of their TEKS that we meet, a lot of these Texas schools just don't meet them, even with the facilities. And that is no disrespect to any other school district. But I think that speaks more to the value of education we get at Gilmer, just from the teachers. And so I believe with our strong teachers and our strong administration that highly believes in the students, I think if we add even more, I believe we would see such an increase and the value of students that come out of here, because the students that are walking these hallways, that will be walking these hallways tomorrow morning, are our future lawyers, our future doctors, our engineers, our, our mayors, our senators. And so I believe by catching up on this, we've, we're at the curve educationally. Right? We're, we're doing our very best, and we're succeeding to remain competitive educationally, along with the whole state. But I believe we've revamped our facilities. I truly believe the sky's the limit for Gilmore ISD. Amen. Amen. I also had a few extra points uh, Mason brought up. Uh, I'm pointing Arson, I'm a former student here. 
I graduated in 2016 with Colby. And uh, another issue is a problem here, uh, bathrooms are a huge problem. Uh, I know former students and current students right now, I know y'all smell sewage in the hallway sometimes. Don't laugh, because I know you have. I know me, personally, I have walked to the vocational building from classes on the 100 hallway all the way on the very side just to go use the bathroom because there wasn't enough people, or there was too many people in the bathroom where I could not even use it. So that caused me into being late for my class, which I ended up getting a tardy for. Oh well, I took it, it's okay, I just had to go use the restroom. Another thing that makes me brought up, science labs are a huge issue. I think right now there are two science labs. Uh, I think with us, I think we got into the, the science lab, got into the science lab maybe three times, three or four times. I think we didn't even experiment. The only thing we can use in our science lab right now is literally a table and a sink, pretty much. The fume system is out of date, so we cannot use anything to do with that. So literally go in there and probably put something on a hot plate, walk out, and that's pretty much all we can use for the science building. Another thing that's an issue here, I think, is the uh, cafeteria itself. So right now there's an A, B, and C lunch. So with B lunch, you kind of miss out on education. You go to class for a little bit, then you go to lunch, then you come back to class. Which I think is completely unfair to some of the other students that go to A lunch, R, C lunch, when they get the value of going to class for a full time, then going to lunch, or going to lunch, and then going to class. Another thing is that the roof, heating, and ventilation systems are all done for. They all met their lifespan. I know a couple of former and, and current students can say, we've seen trash cans in the hallways and having to walk around them because the roof is leaking. I know that happened my senior year, and I'm sitting here going, why isn't this fixed? Why don't we not have a new high school? Another thing is, I think if a new high school was built, it'd be appealing to businesses. Businesses would be like, you know what, I would love to send my employees to this uh, state-of-the-art high school. Look how nice this thing is. It's very appealing to me. And I think even the current students, our students in other districts are like, well, look at this high school. Gilmer's got a nice high school. I know I played sports growing up, and everybody used to tell me, you go to school there? I'm like, yeah, I go to school there. You know, I'm proud of it. I really am. You know, it's Gilmer High School. I'm proud to be a Gilmer Buckeye. But yes, I went to school in that building. And then some people were like, man, I just don't know how you made it. So I just feel like, I feel like if we had a new school, I think it would, like Mason said, it could greatly benefit with the students and the teachers. And we could send our kids so much more better. So we can enhance them with the technology that they have here that we currently do not have here at this high school. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. I will real quick touch on something as far as the, the cafeteria part yeah. goes. That was something that we had talked about as far as that bigger core facility. The cafeteria was going to be larger, it was accommodating more, and so that would allow for two lunches instead of three. So you'd be able to do what you were talking about and, and be able to, to accommodate two lunches instead of having that, that, that B lunch, basically. Yes, sir. Uh, we brought up something too, Cena, about how realistic is the possibility of you and Bill consolidating with us? Mm -hmm. <coughs> how many students was that we talked about? Mm -hmm. Three hundred. Mm -hmm. That's not your total, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I thought around four yeah. hundred. Yeah, it was around two hundred, two hundred, two fifty, somewhere in that range, I would say. And we we did include that in. Well, and the, the new high school, the <laughs> the proposal is for eight hundred students, mm -hmm. and we're currently running. What did you say, Brian? Seven. Yeah, seven hundred. 700, so there's room. So even if you, because you think about high school there, if they have 200 to 250 students combined through K through 12, <coughs> you're looking at about 40 to 50 high school you know, graduating class. So, or I mean, excuse me, not graduating class, but high school. Does anybody students. know where that rumor came from? They've talked about that in years. Oh, we live out John. Yes, uh, John. Like Ms. Cadelka had the next question. Oh, Thank you. Uh, can you explain to me the I had had some interesting thinking, and it's used for capital projects. It's used for long-term payments. Uh, it is, as Dr. Oates said, it's un, it's unequalized. In other words, the state doesn't have Robin Hood for INS, but it's what you pay for your long-term debt out of. It. It has to be dedicated specifically to pay your debt. <coughs> Maintenance and operating is the other portion. Of it. Our tax rate there <coughs> covers things like salaries. It covers things like uh, just utilities. 
supplies, travel. In Gilmer, Texas, that takes up, salaries take up about 81% of our total maintenance and operating budget. Uh, the rest, the other 19% goes to travel, supplies, um, utilities. The utilities make up probably the next 8 or 9%. They're the next larger cost. So uh, there isn't a lot of, <clears throat> when we pay people, that, that uses up the bulk of the budget. You can't, that's the, the tax rate that I said is maxed out. We can't raise that tax rate without going back to the, the voters uh, it, with our maintenance and operating. We can't go... We can't raise our tax rate uh, for INS without going to the voters. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Tom, thank you. Uh, when I graduated from uh, <coughs> Gilmer High School, this, in this very building right here, <laughs> it was uh, it was 30 years old. Well, I know I may not look like it, but that was 38 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so this building is nearly 70 years old. And, uh, I think we've about got our money's worth out. Amen. 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 Yes, um, I don't want to affirm what this man said. <clears throat> um, one of the things that we're trying to do with the city is promote economic development. We can't use EDC dollars for economic development because it goes out to the lake. So we really started out with one hand tied behind our back. And so when other cities, all the information I'm reading, when businesses look to relocate, and I'm not talking about like a retail, like a, a water burger or anything like that. I'm talking about a company that employs uh, several, if not a few hundred people. One of the top things they look at is education in that county, in that city. And uh, if they come here and they see what the school looks like and everything, first impressions are everything. And so it's just something to consider. I'm from Dallas, Arlington. I've been here a little over a year now, and I, I continually ask myself, why doesn't Gilmer and Upshur County have more going for it than it does? I really haven't figured that out yet. But I'm sure a part of it is the education system, the schools. And to me, $24, whatever that was, I look at it as investing in the next generation. Amen. My kids are in a, are, have already graduated, but I'm still investing in other kids. Yes, sir. And there's an intangible benefit to education. The, 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 the kids who, are, who receive quality education have less of a chance to enter into a life of crime. And so these people whose kids are grown, like me and everything, there's still a benefit to paying school district taxes. <laughs> and I always say, you know, invest, look in something bigger than yourself, invest in the next generation, because they are going to be the next leaders. So, Would you introduce yourself? I'm the city manager here. <laughs> <Greg Hudson. laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Sure. Something that John said when, when he and I graduated, not from Gilmer, but a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think that the board addressed this, was security. When the classes change at this school, if you were looking at it from above, it would look like a fire ant mound that you put a stick and just got everybody stirred up. Because there's kids going and coming in every direction, crossing streets. Yes, uh, yeah. Safety, control. That was brought up, and that was that one was, of the main reasons we, that was okay. another reason to move the Cape building. Right, with right. The core. Um, you know, when we graduated, we never dreamed that anybody would come on campus with a gun and try to do harm to whomever. But, and don't think it can't happen here, because everywhere that that's happened, they thought the same thing. So, security issue, and that's something I can't put a $9,000 price tag or a $24,000 price tag on it. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, the committee spent a lot of time talking about that. I mean, <coughs> that was that was one of our kind of one of our first uh, big points that we made was the security aspect, and especially you think about how many accesses there are as far as this high school, how many open doors to the outside there are here. There's so many different access points that people <coughs> come into throughout the day, coming behind students, even if they're locked. You, 
steal. They can come in behind students or, you know, there's so many different things that we looked at as far as that goes. That was one of the, the, the big things that we first initially talked about um, that, that we made a, a big point to consider. And um, one thing that was brought up, I, the states, and you correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm going to use one of those terms, but the state funding is based on a per pupil, and that's the ADA, the average daily attendance. <coughs> so we get, I'll come to you just a second. We get money based upon our average daily attendance. Uh -oh. the, the kids that go to the ag, they are weighted 40% heavier. So instead of 1.0, we get 1.4 times the ADA for kids that are in classes over there. When it rains, these ag teachers have to come roam the halls and look in the bathrooms because the kids are hiding in there because they don't want to cross the street in the rain. And so having a, it, it just makes financial sense to get everybody together because those kids going there, we get more money from the state when they're there. Um, on, on the security, were you in your plan for that? Does that include a fence around the property? Uh, like yeah. pine tree or... Yeah, it, well, especially with it being a, this is a clo closed campus right now. Uh, I say that loosely, but it's a it's a closed campus right now. Um, we have, we had talked about different considerations as far as you know whether it be fencing or um, basically having maybe mainly a main focused entrance where everybody comes in through that specific. I know we we say that's kind of how it is right now, but at the same time, you you know especially with you have when you have so many people spread out and moving like Mr. Gray said. Fire ants look everywhere. Um, you know, we have considered a lot of different things as far as on the on the security aspect of it. We don't have a set in stone what we're gonna, you know, how set. it's gonna be designed. Yeah. That's the thing. It's that when you, I've learned quite a bit about being in these committees, and one of the things is that you don't really, you don't, you have to pass the bond first. There's no sense in making plans about if you're gonna have two story, or if you're gonna have a central hall, or if you're gonna do this, or you're gonna have these classrooms. What we try to do as a committee is make recommendations as to size and to seeing about the needs of teachers and the student population. And also to try to invest a little bit more in careers and technology. So right now we have, you know, as you know, when you were growing up, we had a library and you went to the library. Well, now we need computer labs. We need also one of the things about this building is that it can't carry the load of everyone's cell phone. We can't, we need the technology upgraded. There's no way to do it in this building at this age. So that's one of the, another, another big plus is that the technology would be so much enhanced <coughs> with a new building. I know I didn't necessarily say, hey, no, what, but, but yeah, <laughs> this, that, that's, that's, a lot of that's in the, the, the near future as far as once we start laying out plans and, and kind of get a, an idea of how it's going to be designed, and that, that, will, that will stem a lot of that part of it. Yes, sir. Well, I'm Brenda Meadows. I'm also a senior here at Gilmore High School. I'd like to touch on a few points. As Mr. Gray said, one time my dad came here to bring me lunch at a crossing period. He just walked through the front door and he saw every kid just walk on by. That is very scary situation if it was someone with force intent and trying to bring me bugs. <coughs> uh, another thing about uh, computer labs and technology we have here. I have a laptop and I'm lucky enough to have a laptop when other students don't. The technology here does not really stay up to par. I can tell you how many times me and Mason, who are lucky enough to have laptops, have to let other people use it because they don't really have access to technology. And we do, but it's so behind data and so sloppy and like old that you really can't use it. It's like trying to use... Uh, and they're doing a real good job they, with what we yeah, have. Yeah, we try, but it's really hard to, to see uh, things like that. Um, another thing, the... Yeah, like that. Uh, just walking through the hallway, some doors are just a door and trying to fit 100 students through one door trying to go to different class is kind of hard. It's like uh, uh, sticking a needle through, I don't know, a penny through a door and all, I don't know. It's really just, it, it needs to be changed. Uh, the economist uh, Thomas Sowell once said that uh, solutions are never possible, only trade-offs. The trade-off here would be 
getting the money now and over these years to have a better school system, to have more people come back. Like Jeffrey here wasn't always at Gilmer. He went to, you lived in and worked at a bank in Dallas, right? Yeah. And you came back here to help out, I guess. Also, I can work, I, yeah, I can work from anywhere in the, in the world, but I work from Gilmer because I enjoy the community. And also, uh, Dr. McDaniel just came back to start a new practice here in Gilmer after Dr. Murray's uh, retirement. I mean, it's better to have a better school to help trade off and get better people in the world to come back here and make this place a better place. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. I've just got one thing, and I'm sure there's an expert or two in here somewhere that could give me an answer to this. Well, okay. If we don't build it now, we have not built it twice, and the cost goes up each time we don't get a bond approved to do what we ultimately want to do. If we don't get something done now, four or five years down the road, and we put the Band-Aid on it then, the Band-Aid will be three-fourths of what it would cost to build a new high school now. But if we don't do that, and we don't get the Band-Aid now, how many years down the road is it going to be before this building falls in and we have no high school? I think that's something that everybody needs to think about. The, the things that are coming immediately. Uh, uh, the roof that was uh, is on this building was put on the building in, in about 1988. Right. So that's 30 years. So it's coming to the end of its life. It's going to have to be replaced. HVAC, uh, where John left. <laughs> Anybody else go to school here? Did y'all have HVAC in 1974? No. Yeah, when did you get it out? They had, they <laughs> had the air conditioning. <laughs> but air conditioning is supposed to last about 16 years. Mm -hmm. We're getting 30 years out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we push everything to its maximum. So that HVAC has to be changed. When you, when you start doing those kind of changes, then you start having to may have major changes in the building. Mm -hmm. When you have major changes in the building, then you have to bring the building up to code. Right. So, so you know, we keep on... Patching, that's one of the reasons uh, the, the leaks still happen. We are not replacing the entire roof because when we replace the entire roof, it's going to be a major investment. There's no question about that. We're going to have to have bond issue for that. So we're, we're trying to put it off as long as we can, but there is going to come a reckoning. When that is, it depends on, I mean, there again, I'm going to praise our maintenance staff. They do an amazing job. And, and, and we have kept this facility. You look at it. And uh, we've got lipstick on a pig. If you're yeah. it. <laughs> but it, it, we do. And our, our kids, while they're not comfortable a lot of times, the electrical load cannot sustain. If you walk through the, the halls tonight, mm -hmm. you're going to see the temperatures about 44 degrees in the hallways. Mm -hmm. Because the HVAC is not connected in the hallways. When they, when they added HVAC here, the electrical load was not strong enough. Every HVAC unit has two heating elements. We only have one hooked up because the electrical will not support it. It's been that way since since it was set. And so those those are issues that are going to have to be addressed. And there's going to come a reckoning where, where you're going to have both those options. To remodel at the same time, you're looking at a three to five year process because you can only do a section at a time. You're going to you either have to bring in portables. It's a lot of a lot of different things you have to think about there. And so, uh, there again, it's just there. It's a, it's a community preference. But you're right. There, there is going to become. And if you don't, let's suppose you wait and build a new high school. Um, interest rates, when we looked at this two years ago, were more about two and a half percent. One percent. If you figure that on a thirty million dollar note, is what? About three hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so just by waiting and then letting interest rates go up one percent, now you're paying three hundred thousand a year in interest. More. That's three cents. It's really four cents on the tax rate just by waiting. And you're not even paying for a building. You're just paying interest because the interest rates are going up. And that's another thing that, that really needs to be considered. The economic outlook for the country is one where there's probably going to be changes in interest rates. Uh, we've been, yeah, we, we've been very fortunate in the past. The good thing about low interest rates, a lot of building can go on. The bad thing is you don't make money on your money. <laughs> and so, there again, those are all considerations that have to be well thought. 
and, and present it, run numbers on them, and, and just see. So those are all considerations. Y'all ask me for the information, and I'll help anybody work to get it. Uh, my office is open all the time. Uh, we're, we're very open. And uh, so. Since this has been attempted a few times in the past couple of years, uh, are we doing a different approach to ensure that this is a successful pass if it's decided to have another bond election? The school district can only present information. And so really it, it needs to be community driven. So it can't be, we don't have consultants available or people well, that will... The, the community has access to those and um, I am officially going, in just a few minutes I'm officially going to end this meeting and someone's going to come speak to that. Okay. But it, it cannot be me or Mr. Aldridge and we, we need to to leave for that conversation. And that, that's something we, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more here in a moment once we get to that. Yeah, just what yeah. you know, we all can do to ensure this is successful this time around. Well, okay. Well, Mr. Albert then used the word remodel, and in my head I'm thinking like, oh, remodel means make it nicer, like you remodel the kitchen. But that's not really what you mean, Mr. Alberton. Like, we are going to have to make the doors big enough for handicap accessible mm -hmm. and stuff like that, right? And add that. You're going to have to have fire sprinklers. You're going to have to add uh, any more bathrooms. Ramps. More bathrooms. So, so structurally, in the state of Texas, what the law says is if you add school, you're really supposed to have an architect. Uh, you've made a structural change to the building. Now, in Kilmer, Texas, we push that a little bit. But, I said that on TV. <laughs> But, but it really comes down to because of the significant changes that have to be made. It's more than just, when you change the roof, you're going to have more than just the cost of the roof that you have to You're required by code. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Albert, I'm going to ask you to speak to the school. Yes, sir. 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 Will the school district be able to become financially sound, or are we just going to keep passing bonds, putting more uh, uh, debt on the taxpayer? Or well, define financially sound. As in, like, they don't have to go... Um, Zero debt? Yes. I'm not aware of any districts that... I don't want to address it. The state law says, that's what an INS fund is for. State law says taxpayers have to pay have to have to pass bond issues for schools. If I were to save money and build our fund balance, we get now, now think about that. That's the state. That. Yeah. If we put back a million dollars a year, that's going to take me 35 years to get cash enough. And really, I'm stealing money from the taxpayers during that time. I'm overtaxing. I'm not. I, well, forget, forget that. <laughs> We're taxing you to maintain. That's why it's called maintenance and operations. We're paying. We're, you're paying taxes so that we do that. The reason the INS is set up, and when you read the education law, it, it says that taxpayers have to approve bond issues to build facilities in communities. They are local community decisions. So really, the idea that a school is ever going to be debt free is going to be a short term thing because there's going to be another building that has to be built, and you can't really save to build a building. So, at what point will Gilmer be able to have much lower debt per person? Well, I mean, we're paying off, off this, uh, the 2004 is paid off in 2030. So at that time, the, the tax rate will, will jump back again. And then you'll, you'll have to look at buildings again. Right now, the next buildings that we're going to have to look at are the intermediate and the uh, junior high that were built in the mid-80s. If you get 70 years out of them, and in the mid-50s or 60s of this century, then you're going to be looking at replacing those buildings. So, and in this case, your debt will be paid off in about 2045 for, let's see, is that right? Let's see, what's 25 or 30 plus 2047? So you'd have about four or five years, maybe longer. If, if we're as good as what we do right now and we make those buildings stretch further, you might go 10 years without uh, that's what That's what we did the last time. We were debt-free when we paid for the when we started the elementary, but we were only debt-free for about five years because we had paid off bonds for the previous time. 
It's just the way the system is set up. Um, you, can't, you can't save money, especially to the tune of $35, $35 million. So the option of being out of debt is to step outside the system and have the impact of the pay. That is correct. Right. And Will, and, there's and a sign-up sheet. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you write me a check for $35 million, we'll start building it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> What's the debt ratio, like debt-to-income of the school district? Debt-to-income, and that, that's a little bit different. That's why there's a lot of different debt ratios. One, the comptroller uses one figure. Everybody uses a lot of different business managers. Do one. When you take our total debt to our total value, then we're at about a, right now we're at about a 6% ratio when you compare debt to value. Which is really when you go out for a loan, do you tell them where you live or do you tell them how much income you have? And so really the, I like that comparison better because it's the ability to raise income rather than the amount of debt to what you're earning. So that's about 6%. Uh, if, if a bond issue is called and if a bond issue is passed, that number goes to about 16 percent. Yes, sir. I worked at the hospital, Good Shepherds, and in that building is, parts of that building are, were built in, I think, the, what, the 30s, probably. And one reason they were going bankrupt is because of the maintenance and operation of maintaining old, outdated buildings. You can put another roof on it. But there was the electrical was next, you know, it was all and over and over. And so isn't part of spending our money smarter trying to save money at some point by building a new building with less overhead on maintenance? Building will be much more energy. That is, that is a good point. The, yes. the new building will be much more energy efficient. You talked about Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, we talked about that Tuesday, the process space says the, uh, the, the cost a great deal of money to just to operate this building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every day, <laughs> and the even though we'll be spending a lot more money, our the cost. And one of the things that coming to these uh, meetings has changed my mind about was the fact that my grandmother planted a tree out in front of the inner the, where the administration building is. And so I thought, we can't get rid of that, you know. But then again, when Mr. Auburn talks about how much money it costs to heat and cool that building that I went to junior high at and is, <laughs> yes, I rolled, I rolled out the window and, you know, stuff like that. But anyway, uh, it, it, it really is, it is. And that was one of the things that the committee talked about is that one, we wanted to focus on building a new high school so that maybe some of these other buildings could be used for other purposes and one would be to move the administration building. And so, I think that uh, Mr. Dodd is going to come forward at this time. Yeah, let me, let me close the meeting. Okay. Um, there was somebody that asked who the speakers were. Jeff Murray, Marty Jordan, Ann Bates, Matthew Potter. I'll be outside with their um, address and phone number if you want to see me after this. If we can go, you can go pound in. <laughs> Um, I did want to thank everybody, um, and um, Mr. Albright touched on it. Um, anytime you have a question, your school board meetings are open, but I'm available, Mr. Albright is available, so if you have questions, uh, feel free. I don't want you to feel like we attacked you tonight, but if you, I'm free for lunch, and if you give me an, enough notice, I'm free for dinner, and so we'd be happy to meet with you to answer your questions. And that goes for anybody here. So, I'm officially going to step out of the building. Mr. Albritton's going to officially leave, and Joe Dodd's got to discuss. Thank y'all for being here. Thanks, Mark.